Welcome. My name's Mario Vitale, and this is Molto Mario. I'm here with my good friend Peaches, Sue, and Allison, and we're talking about La Cucina Italiana. More specifically, La Cucina Napoletana, Naples, the heart of Campania. Today's show is called Sweet Sunday Dinner. It's a dinner that isn't made for just a regular hullable day when you come home and you got to get home and make something in a hurry. This is a day of almost a celebratory, delicious and simple, magnificent food that in Italian culture is represented best by Sundays themselves. We're going to make a, f a simple soup that's actually called cooked bread because we're just going to rustle up some broccoli and bread and water and broth. Then we're going to make something called croquet di patate, which is reminiscent of the most magnificent magnificent shops that they have in all of Campania called Frigitorie, which are just these little fry shops. We're going to make a calzone and we're also going to make some bracciole. First thing up is when you deal with soup in Italy, you realize you don't have to spend a lot of time making broths based on reduced stocks made with the bones of the animals whose dreams you're trying to <laughs> co-op into your soup. You just want something to be simple and light and very flavorful and seasonal and often enough it's hammered the vegetable. It's not like it's al dente, it's not bright green, it's not holding a Shape. And that's what we're going to deal with. The first one is called pan cotto con broccoli, which just means cooked bread with broccoli. You're going to see that the whole thing comes together in this kind of brothy, loose, fibrous mass. The thing that's a little bit different is in, it's particularly in Campania, but all over Italy, there are four or five different kinds of broccoli. We're used to this one and broccoli rob pretty much in America. The ones that have, the ones that they're most famous for in Campania have a lot more of this leafy component and a lot less of this floret component. But the flavor is about as similar. If anything, the one in Italy is a little bit more bitter, which is something the Italians are certainly fond and in love with. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut it, but we're not just going to use the broccoli florets. We're going to use the whole thing, and we're just going to dump it right into plain old ordinary boiling water that we salt almost as aggressively as we would as if we were making pasta. And that's because that's going to season the whole dish so we're not afraid of using a little bit of salt. If you are salt sensitive or have some issues with salt, put less in. Cooking is not that difficult to do. So we're going to get the broccoli in there and we're just going to allow it to bubble and cook. We, we had the, the water full on boiling initially. And we're just going to allow it to come back to the boil. And it's literally going to cook 10, 15 minutes. Totally against everything Julia Child ever taught us. But don't worry about it. It's going to be good. Mario, now, so yes. you're not taking the skin off the, the stalks? Like not at all. We would, we, the whole idea behind Italian vegetables is that they, as little as possible, denature them. Yeah. They want them to look exactly right. like they did right. in the garden. And they like the fact that there's some fiber on the outside right. or there's something to chew through or that there's technical or textural variation. So that's all the beautiful thing. Now, while that's cooking away, the next thing we're going to start is our calzone. Calzone come in two, t two kinds in Italy. They're either baked or they're fried. We're going to make some baked ones. What we're going to take here is basic pizza dough, basic bread dough, which is flour, water, salt, yeast, touch of sugar or honey, and a little bit of wine, in my opinion. Then what you do is you mix the whole thing up. You let it rise once. You punch it down. You roll it into the shapes or the sizes that you want, and you bring it into something like this. Then you allow it to rest again so it does a second rise, and then you just make your calzones. Now, the trick is understanding don't be afraid of yeast. Yeast is your friend. So we're just going to make a couple of rounds here, and the way you do it is just like you see the pizzaiolos in all the famous movies, is you use the tops of your fingers, and you just go like that and slam it, and then start going like this. Now in Italy, what you'll notice is they rarely have the big pizza guy throwing them a thousand times in the air. They'll do it just a couple of times, but that's because real pizza dough is a little bit more delicate than you might imagine. It's not something that has got so much gluten that you can throw the pies. I remember when I was in college, I used to work at a place called Stuff Your Face in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and it was without a doubt the hottest pizzeria in town, and all the cool people came there in New Brunswick, and we had a very glutinous dough that, in retrospect, was a little bit chewier than it should have been. And what we would do is we had the stunt pie team. And on Fridays and Saturdays, when the restaurant was particularly busy, the guys, me and a couple of the cooks, would go back out there and we'd be throwing it around like this right. across the dining room and stuff like that. Well, it worked well, but now that I'm the owner of a pizzeria, you realize that it's a little bit different. And it's a little bit more sensitive than you might have imagined. So I'm going to bring out two of these, and now we're going to talk about the fillings. At Stuff Your Face, we used to make what was called stromboli, and we used to put whatever we wanted into it. It could go from broccoli, tomato sauce, grilled eggplant, chili and beans, the whole thing. In Italy, when you go to a pizzeria and you order a calzone, it's only one variety. It only has ricotta, prosciutto cotto, and a little bit of mozzarella. So that's the kind we're going to make today. 
And it's very simple. These are the classics. And that's what we do. I'm going to make a thicker one, and I'm going to make a thinner one. You're going to see how they flip out. And Mario, why do they only have the one variety? The, the Italians are just obsessive like that. <laughs> there's there's <laughs> only one way to make it. The it's the right way to do it. Uh -huh. We're going to take a little ricotta. We're going to take a little pecorino. We're going to take a little fresh mozzarella, mm -hmm. which it's bears really no really resemblance good. to the yellow bricks sitting in our deli cases and refrigerated grocery Mary, stores. Really yeah, it is really exactly. Really this is the real thing. I'll pass it around a little bit when we taste really it. Really now good. what we're going to do is we're just going to stuff this with that. Now and you're it's, mixing that up and just kind of That's it. Just it mix in. it up, throw it okay. in. You could do without the egg if you were going to be an absolute purist, but this is a right. little bit festive because we've got the pretty girls here today. <laughs> So and we're going to change it Mario, a little bit. Is this yes. the same dough that you would use for pizza? Too? Exactly the same dough. Oh, okay. They don't change it at all. Anything. Now what we're going to see is when we fold these up, that they're going to puff up Whoa. substantially in the oven. But all we want to do is close them up like so. Now what we want to do is just get them on a pizza peel. In the oven, I have been heating up a pizza stone because that's truly the basic sign of success. And having a pizza stone in there, we're going to be able to develop that beautiful crisp bottom that we like, as well as the top. You notice that I put a whole mess of rock salt on there. And what that's going to do is kind of stick a little bit to the bottom of the crust and season it a little bit. But you don't necessarily need to worry about it. It's most important factor is that it's going to allow it to move around. So now we're going to get a little egg wash on this. We've got our oven up as high as we could possibly go. It's at 525. We're going to toss these in, and when we come back, we're going to taste them and rescue that drowning broccoli oh, right. from its beautiful situation. <laughs> so please, stay with us. Now, our calzones are just about finished. Our broccoli is just about hammered. Now we're going to make the soup. And to make it, all you need to do is take a little bit of chili, whatever kind you like, hot pepper, whatever it wants to be. We're going to take about four cloves of garlic, and we're going to toast them. Now remember, in the north, they like their garlic just lightly toasted through. In the south, they like a lot more garlic, and they like it cooked until it's pretty golden, deep golden brown. The way we're gonna stop it from cooking is by timing the broccoli drop just exactly right. Now into this soup, we're just gonna use water, the cooking water from the broccoli, and bread to thicken it, as well as seasoning it just right. And you'd be surprised and amazed at how good food tastes when you just season it right and you haven't used any broth or anything crazy. Anything silly, anything absurd. So we've got that in there. Mary, We're going to see. How much broth are you going to put in? You'll see. You'll okay. see. <laughs> Certainly just enough to cover that broccoli and to moisten all of this bread I just cut up. This is generally day old bread. You wouldn't buy fresh bread to make your soup. The, the ability of the Italians to make sure that they always use everything in a completely Spartan way is one of the amazing things about the culture. And also one of the reasons why the food tastes so genuine and honest when you're there. Because they didn't take 45 steps to make the broth, to make the soup. It was something that's made on a daily basis, more by grandmas than by technicians trained in a college who wear big hats and chop with aggressive structure. Mario, um, do certain breads work better than others in this? The best bread would be the one that was left over from the day before. The Campania, the bread of the Campania has a relatively rustic, full grain, I mean not full grain, full miga, the crumb is very, very dense, and the crust is very crunchy and hard. And since they don't put any preservatives in it, it gets, you know, it gets old in one day. It's not soft in day two. So that's it. But the most important thing would be more that you have the bread left over from the day before. You wouldn't go out and buy a loaf of bread to make this. So there, now it's just gonna start bubbling and bubbling. We're gonna clear some area for our calzones. And, oh yeah. Mario, those look so good. These look really good, huh? And they puffed up just right. You got your pizza peel. And now we taste. And it's going to be hot, so. Mm. 
Yeah. Okay. Isn't this just a great moment? Mm. When things are just that good yeah, and that yeah, simple yeah. and that just hot and right. Be very careful. Let it cool for a second before you really Thank get you. into it. But the beauty of that is, is the beauty of that. Now, this is great. This is even good served room temperature. It's not a big issue. It's not a problem. You want to be able to be comfortable with making this stuff. If you toss it back in the oven and reheat it for a few minutes whole, it's never a problem. Go ahead and try it, ladies. Yeah. Now, we've got our soup bubbling away. Now we're going to make croque, or croquetas, as they say in Spanish. We've taken regular old boiling russet potatoes. We've boiled them with their jackets on, which is very... Italian. They never peel them and cook them. They cook them with the skins on and they take them off. They peel them with their little fork. I can still see thousands of grandmas doing it. And you pass them through either a food mill or a ricer. This is the most important step. This is what is going to decide the texture of this and that it's light. There are two key aspects in this. One that you use an old starchy potato. And second, when you pass it through the ricer, at this point you realize it's important not to play with it too much. If you mix it and mix it and mix it, you're going to get this gummy, doughy mass. If you just delicately treat it like it's snow that you want to flake all over the place, <laughs> then it's another game. So we add all the dry ingredients first. We're going to add a little pecorino. We're going to add... Mary, what kind of... Um, where is pecorino from? Pecorino Go is a sheep from Pecora. It's a sheep milk cheese and the Pecorino Romano that they love so much down in Naples, as well as Cacio Cavallo, which are the two big cheeses besides the fresh cheeses, mozzarella, scamorza, and all of those. Those are sheep driven and very aged, intensely strong in flavor, and that's the reason why they give you such a funny, hairy eyeball when you ask for them <laughs> sprinkled over your linguine with seafood. It's just not acceptable. So now we're going to take bread, eggs, potatoes, touch of salt, and we're just going to lightly mix this whole thing together. You don't want to start to try to make a snowball out of it. You want to just bring it together so that when the egg comes in contact with it, what it will do is just loosely bind that. We're going to take one beaten egg white to kind of give it a little fluffy souffle-like action, although if you speak French on this set, you will be banned. <laughs> And then we're going to season it with just a little bit more salt, a touch of parsley, and we're going to start to fry them. Now, in Italy, we fry in extra virgin olive oil. So I have extra virgin olive oil. People complain that they think the smoking point is too low or this or that. But when you've had the carciofi alla Judea, like they make them in Rome, there is nothing like it. It is remarkable and perfect. So we're just going to form them into little balls like that in our hand. We're going to drop them into oil that's about 375. When we come back, we'll take these little puppies out and we'll reminisce about the frigitorie of Campania. Stay with us. Delish? Love to hear that. Hey, welcome back. Well, we've got our beautiful croquet, and they're hot, they're zippy. We're gonna dust them with a little bit more pecorino, a touch of parsley. Be very careful that one of the sides of this plate is hot. And go ahead and take one. Very yeah, can you tell us which side? Oh, thank you. I'm not, so just grab Mario, one and be safe. Great. The next thing we have is our soup, because it's buffet time here. Before I get the soup going, I wanna throw these onions in here, because we're gonna now make bracciole al sugo, a classic Neapolitan Sunday dinner that you would often enough serve the sauce of the braising of both the bracciole and the meatballs as the pasta sauce for your first course. But since we're rich and luxurious, we're not going to pay attention to that. Now to serve the soup, how is that? It's really good. Is it good? Is it too hot to eat? Mario, that smells no. great. That Somebody is your soup. Great. Now to finish wow. the soup, you would serve it, of course, in Naples with a little bowl of the spicy pepperoncino on the side. So I'll do the same. But right now I'm gonna drizzle it with just a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, dust it with a little bit of cheese, and just taste that soup because it is truly water, broccoli, bread, and a little bit of this cheese. And if you want something a little spicy, here's a little pepperoncino to put on the top. Now I've got my onions going in the back here. This is gonna serve to further make more delicious our little ragu of bracciole. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a filling 
for the inside of these bracciole. Now, I've already made some meatballs. These are your standard Neapolitan meatballs, about 40% bread. Because what we realized in this country is we started to try to make our meatballs out of all meat because we're rich and we don't need to stretch it out anymore. But what happened is they got tough and chewy. And that's because we forgot the most important tenet of this beautiful food is that in addition to showing off our wealth, we want it to be delicious, tender, and soft. And without the right amount of bread in there, it became just this firm little dried out ball. No bueno. So now this is the filling that's going on. Yes, how is that, Sue? Mario, it's great. It's definitely not mom's broccoli. <laughs> no, it's not mom's. <laughs> Hammered to all head broccoli exactly. from 1973 <laughs> TV dinners. Right. Now I'm going to take veal, but you could just as easily take pork. You could just as easily take chicken breasts or even better, chicken legs that have had the bone removed from them to make these little bracciole. And we're going to put a little garlic and Mary, a little you parsley. Have the parsley is much rougher cut than I think usually. Yes, it is. And that is because I love the texture of it once it's inside and braised in this dish. As I was saying earlier, there's a huge difference between lazy and rustic. And you have to make that understanding that to not chop this might be perceived as lazy. But once you eat these, when they're braised all the way through, you'll see it's almost like having a little chewy salad inside, which is something I really like. Now, we're going to roll them up. I'm sorry, I rolled it without talking about what I was doing. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a toothpick. You take these little guys. We season them on the inside, very important. I sprinkle a little pecorino, the parsley, the garlic, a little bit of hot chilies. And I'm going to roll this up. And I'm just going to attach it with a toothpick. Mary, why do the Italians love to roll things? We well, it's, it's almost exclusively southern Italians yeah. that love to roll things. It's because all those grandma hands need something to do. <laughs> They're sitting My around. My Sicilian grandmother rolled everything. Right. Well, the Sicilians are the biggest rollers exactly. of all time. Eggplant. Well, it shows that they're putting, you know, they love the idea of it having more than just that big... I mean, think about what Americans really prize. What's the big dinner? A huge big roast beef or a big steak. Right. And there it is, just sitting there, and it's all the same all the way through. There's no variation in the bites. If you'll note, I'm putting two toothpicks in one of these. Whoever gets the second toothpick does the dishes in our house. <laughs> so, so you're always trying to be very careful to make sure you don't get the wrong one. Mario, this bread has been transformed, right, into mm. something Isn't that else. amazing? It's so very good. Yeah. I love really that. Soft. And the oil. There's a lot. Of the oil's well, the drizzle of the oil is what really helps make that into something different. Now, I've got my onions going. <clears throat> I'm going to start to brown my bracciole. And I'm also going to start to brown the meatballs. And this is something that the Neapolitan grandma starts in the morning on that Sunday. They don't need to make it the day before. But the big meal, sometimes, they'll make a really festive one. And it'll have chicken thighs and spare ribs and meatballs and bracciole and the whole thing. This is, this is a Sunday in the summer when we're just having a kind of a light five-course meal today. <laughs> so we've taken the meatballs. This could be ground veal. This could be ground pork. Generally, it's a mix of veal and, or beef and pork. The breadcrumbs, a little bit of egg, parsley, and whatever else you want. I put lemon zest in these because I'm really fond of that. And what we want to do is just brown them by rolling them around. And then we're going to braise them in a tomato sauce. Now, what I like to use is my basic tomato sauce that we have right here. That's garlic, onions, a little bit of grated carrot, and thyme, and then just canned, crushed canned tomatoes from, uh, at, hopefully, from in and around Naples, which is where the best tomatoes come from. Okay, Mary, you leave the, pits, the little seeds, I mean, the tomato seeds in. Oh, absolutely. Crushed whole tomatoes. Definitely don't. I don't remove anything from there. Again, getting to the whole concept of denatured. I like as much as possible the vegetables to look like that. If I was looking for a smooth pizza sauce, I may put it through the, the cedar and get that going. Now I'm going to add these onions, and I'm going to add just a little bit of the basic tomato sauce, and we're going to simmer this whole thing for probably an hour. When we come back, I'll show you how we bring the whole dish together. And here we are. Sunday. It's sunny. We're looking out over the Bay of Naples. Ooh, Sophia, how's it going? Oh, that's looking good. Now, 
traditionally, if it was a, if we hadn't had as much as we'd eaten already today, <laughs> what we would do is take all of this meat out of here like so, arrange it on a platter, and then set it aside on top of the stove because we would have either rigatoni or penne to toss in this braising sauce to serve as the pasta course to our big meal. So, but we're not going to do that today because we think we've had enough with the croquet and the soup and the calzone. And although it's still Sunday, we're expecting Sophia on the way over any minute now. So we'll see what happens. But here it is, the beautiful bracciole and polpette al sugo. I want to thank you guys for being here. You've made it a lot of fun. I'm like you guys for being here. I look forward to seeing you on the next Multimario. Well,